I'm flat out cheap, so <laughs> we're good. <laughs> well, let me get us started off with a word of prayer, and uh, and we will we will just jump right in here. Lesson five, Father God, we just come to you this morning. We thank you so much for the power of your Son Jesus Christ. Uh, we thank you so much for the power of your Holy Spirit, and uh, we thank you for your amazing grace and mercy for us. We come today um, just asking you to open up your word that we would understand what it is that we choose and how it is that we choose to live um, with grace and with law and that you would as we open up this word uh, that you would help us to see uh, ourselves and see others the way that you see them um, we just thank you so much for this time ahead we just give it to you in jesus name we pray amen amen there are times in this book uh or in our lesson book, actually, I should say it more accurately. In our lesson book, where uh, I will duplicate a couple verses from the last <laughs> from the last uh, lesson. This is this is one of those instances in the fact that some some of these transit what I call a transitional thing. It's the end of a statement. So Paul makes the end of a statement, but it's also the beginning of another idea. And so I just kind of duplicate things. So some of this uh, gets uh, a little repetitive um, on sometimes. Just just give me a little bit extra grace, and we're going to jump into this. Uh, this is one of those things that we have. I'll say it last week. I wanted to spend some time on it. We just didn't get there. But there was an idea that that Paul said that we know. Almost as if before Jesus came, we know that the law can't save us, okay? So we're going to explore that idea a little bit today as well. We're in Galatians chapter 2, verse uh, 14. Uh, yeah, 14. What did I do here? Oh, I got a typo. Okay. You can either read the first two verses on the page or the second two verses on the page. I'm not sure why that's in there twice, but it's there. Uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 14. Uh, when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth, uh, talking to uh, Peter and to James, he said, I, I said to Peter in front of them all, you are a Jew. Jew. Okay. So this is Paul, and he's talking to Peter. Peter, we saw last week, was uh, kind of backing away from the Gentiles because of some external pressures. He says, you were a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. Basically, Peter is enjoying this. And you're saying, Larry, what is this? This is pepperoni pizza. Pepperoni <laughs> pizza. <laughs> but amazingly to the people that I know that have been to Jerusalem say you can't find a pepperoni pizza or a sausage pizza in Jerusalem. I mean, just... Anyway. <clears throat> he says... How is it then do you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Okay. Lesson five. Yes, ma'am. Lesson five. They didn't number when he printed it. Yeah, I, I have two extra verses in there. They, they just got repeated. So skip along with me. Now here's the interesting thing. Let's take a look at, you know, how many of you have ever thought about Jewish custom for some of the things that we do because of the Jewish part of our faith? Any any idea what that entails? No? We're, okay, here's, here's the strange thing that uh, a couple things. A couple things in the world. How, how it says in the world's eyes. Uh, first off, is that the, the Jews were kind of looked at as a little odd and a little lazy because they took a day off. 
So they would have stopped work Friday night um, and then taken all day Saturday off and then gone back to work on Sunday. When the church was established, uh, early on it was celebrated that Jesus rose on the first day of the week. And so the Gentiles took a day off, <laughs> being Sunday. And my gut says is that the reason we have the weekends is both Jewish and Gentile. Okay. Hmm. All right. I thought that was interesting. Um, how many has ever had boiled pig and milk? Yeah, your your cochon de lait, as they'd say down in Louisiana. Nobody. I'm pretty thankful that I have it either. But there's some cooking things um, that you shouldn't do. Uh, I had some friends that were uh, visiting, their friends and family, from here. I can't remember who it was, but they were visiting Disney World and they got a knock on their door um, saying, could you come in and turn our oven on for us, please? Because it was Saturday. It's like, yeah, I can come to do, if they turned the oven on, that was work and you can't work on the Sabbath. <laughs> I have no clue. I have no clue. I have no clue. But but one of the things, yeah, yeah. Somebody on the other side. Somebody on the other side. Um, you know, this whole this whole thing is is still pretty weird. Uh, over the last couple of years, um, I've had a chance to. Uh, I've been reading some of the Seventh Day Adventist guys and stuff, and it's it, you know. It, weird well you can't you can't do you know, I mean they're the seventh how do I say this the seventh day Adventists that's why they believe in Jesus are the people that would say well you have to have all these Jewish customs and you have to follow these uh, because what got me started on it was a conversation that I had with somebody out of Boys City and apparently um, this is goes back 30 40 years or so. <clears throat> There was a big movement that started out in Boise City that said, if you want to be a Christian, you also have to observe all the Jewish feasts. Uh, Renee and I know people who are in that group that that they that they won't work on Saturday. Uh, they they you know absolutely no work on Saturday, and they still observe, observe the Jewish feasts, and yet they call themselves Christians. And so, in this whole context, uh, you know, Paul is saying this is completely. Irrelevant. Uh, now, I, frankly, I don't know how they get to this part reading Galatians. <laughs> I mean, I just, I just don't understand. But that's okay. Uh, Peter says that the Jewish customs are irrelevant. No, no, no. Larry says that the Jewish customs are irrelevant. Peter was saying that if you want to be a good Christian, okay, that if you're a Gentile, you have to follow the Jewish customs. Okay. And this is the hypocrisy that Paul was calling him on. He said, Peter, you live like a Gentile. You're already eating, you're already over here eating pepperoni pizza. Okay? Why do you expect Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? And the big part of it was, well, because we've always done it that way. Okay? Uh, so why come that to today? How does that bring that into today's world? Yes, yeah, and, and <coughs> this is how I have to address it. It's called tradition without substance. Okay. Uh, what happens in tradition without substance is. There's a set. There's a part that we've always done it this way. Um, like a long, a long time ago, I would say, do you know how many elders in the church it takes to change a light bulb? The answer is, what do you mean change? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, just, but but then like you know how many youth ministers it takes to change a light bulb? Well, youth ministers usually aren't around long enough for the light bulbs to burn out, you know, so. Yeah, I'm spoken like a youth minister. Here we go. 
what happens is, is that we have it. We as people have a tendency to establish tradition without substance. Um, it, it's the idea that we want to signify something, but over the years we've lost the importance of it. Okay. Uh, one of the thing, one of the stories that I think probably best illustrates this, um, the, around Thanksgiving time, that there was a, a daughter who was her first time learning how to cut the cut the turkey, get it get ready, and um, you know, mom was showing her. She said, "Well, the first thing we do is we cut this part of the neck off, uh, this part of the turkey off, and then we just go ahead and start fixing it." Well, why do you do that? Well, because that's how my mom did it. So. A uh, little girl calls grandma and said, Grandma, why do we cut the front end of the turkey off before we put it in? She said, well, that's because that's how my mom taught me. Uh, great grandma was still alive, so she calls great grandma. Grandma, why do we cut the front end of the turkey off? Because my pan was too small. <laughs> or the ham. Or the you know, however you want to, you know, however you want to tell, tell the story. Something because of convenience or because it meant something uh, got established as tradition. Uh, strange thing, uh, just because I can observe it uh, from a 35 year separation, I can't. Uh, there were some things that were done the same way that when I was a kid there at camp, uh, one of the big, biggest things was this game called Foursquare. Okay, you know, so you get in, you play this game with four squares, you try to get the ball into somebody else's square type of a thing uh, without getting out. If you're out, you go to the end of the line. And one of the cool things was for me is that when I got there, it's like, oh, they still play four square. Oh, that, oh, sound. And it was still in the same place on the same part of the cement where, they, where I did it 35 years ago. But there's a lot of new things too. Uh, one of the one of the statements was you know, out of last year's camp was um, it's kind of the same old thing every year, and so they were changing some things up this year uh, just to get a different experience. Um, and sometimes we sometimes we will hold tradition, uh, even if it has substance, we will hold tradition in high regards. Uh, and so what happens here is that the traditions, the customs, the laws. Uh, somehow here in the early church uh, this was getting to be a big deal uh, here in this next verse you can kind of start seeing uh, kind of start seeing the, the disparity in it and this is uh, Galatians chapter 2 verse 15 he says we who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners Know that a man is not justified by observing the law. So here's the, here's the thing that Paul makes a statement, okay? I'm not sure if you've ever pondered what I call the doctrine of justification or this idea of being justified, okay? But Paul says... That Jews are not justified through the law. And he says, we know that. Now, I, I read a little bit more into this just because I'm weird. Uh, there's a part here to me that says that somehow Paul had established with himself, I think before his Jesus experience. I can't prove it. But I want to say before his Jesus experience, there was something that he knew about the law that it can't justify a person. And here's what I mean by justification. When we sin, okay, the idea is that out of the book of Hebrews, uh, or the command is rather, there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. So that when we sin, our blood is held accountable. In other words, there is death because of our sin. We see that in the book of Genesis. Uh, that's a pretty, pretty easy statement all the way through. The question is, is that how is justice made? Okay, you ever thought about justice? Okay, when you go to the court of law, how is justice upheld? You ever got a speeding ticket? You ever tried to go to court over it? 
you ever still end up paying the speeding ticket? <laughs> uh, because the law demands justice, okay? So justified is the idea that justice is still done in the midst of in the midst of all of this thing. Now the law, the only thing the law can do is hand out penalties. Which is really, that's why police don't pull you over for driving nice. <laughs> and, and, you know, and if they do, it's like, why are you pulling me over, <laughs> you know? Just wanted to be here. Just wanted to, yeah, yeah, really nice car, you know? <laughs> thought I'd, kind of bored, just thought I'd sit and chat with you. <laughs> it's like, the law has, the, the law basically only has punishments attached to it. Establishes parameters, establishes punishments for not following it. And so the idea of justification is, is that how do we as sinners get our price paid? Okay. The reality of it is, without Jesus, we pay our own price. That is why the Old Testament system of sacrifices was established. If there is no forgiveness without blood, that's why you'd bring bulls and goats and birds and all this other stuff uh, into the temple and have a sacrifice done and so that the blood, the blood of an innocent, would pay for the sin of the guilty. Okay? Follow that so far? Uh, and here's what Paul is saying. So we know that you can't get you can't be justified through the law. We Jews cannot be justified through the law. Watch this, watch this next statement with me here. Um, it's but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too, we as Jews, okay, have put our faith in G in Christ Jesus that way that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law because by observing the law no one will be justified now when we started off this whole thing with the great big things the idea of faith on our great big boards up here is the idea that what you know you've, you've heard me say this what we believe matters and because what we believe matters, it's our faith that justifies God sending Jesus Christ, his son, to pay for our sin. Now, this is big doctrine. I understand it. <laughs> I mean, I, I get that some of you may be hearing this for the first time, and some of you may be saying, Larry, I don't care. And it's okay. Either way. <laughs> Either way. But it's one of these foundational things for us to be able to understand. Because when we get into a conversation with people outside the church, the question is, what do I have to do? What you know, where's my where's my checklist? Uh, and the checklist is Jesus and Him alone. And that's really hard for those of us who want to be able to prove our performance. Okay, really is hard. Um, okay, let's let's let me stop right here real quick. Any questions? About, I know I have this kind of deep stuff. Any questions before we move on to the easy stuff? <clears throat> Larry, it's not a question, but the way I've, we've talked about before and that I was taught is justification. It's just as, as if I never sinned because the blood yes. of Christ yes. covers that. So, you know, the law, you take the law out of that, it's the blood that saves us. Yeah. That's where justification. So I guess in my mind, that definition I always think is just as if I never said. Right. And that is a discussion. Like I've had recently with someone, if I come to your church, what do I have to do and what do I not have to do? Do I have to give an offering? Do I have to be baptized? Do I have to, um, what was the third thing they asked me? I can't remember what the third thing was right now. And I'm like, you don't have to do anything. Well, but don't you like have some kind of list or whatever that I have to do. Yeah. I have a grandfather who's been gone probably 20 plus years yeah. and uh, he was a Methodist is what he would say. He never went to church. But once a year he gave his 
whatever that money was yeah. he was supposed to give to the Methodist church. So yeah. he said he was Methodist. You know, but he would say, well, that's what I am because I give that money. But I remember as I got older and probably because I was, you know, my father was a minister and having those very limited discussions. It's like, well, I don't need to do anything because I give my money and that's all that matters. Yeah. Your church might tell you different, but that's what I do. Yeah. And so in some people's mind, they have that. If I just have that one thing I have to do that's measurable, yeah. you know, it's okay. That'll get me there. You know, that's the, that's the hardest part. That's the hardest part about this doctrine is that you can measure sacrifice. The animal is dead or it isn't. <laughs> you know, you can measure that. It is really hard to measure your internal faith. Because the question is, is it enough and why? And the reality of it is, is that, you know, the law, Paul basically in these couple verses is saying, not only can the law not create a way for us to, to have our sin paid for, but it's, the, the only thing it can do is define it. And that's the argument that he makes in Romans, is that the law defines what sin is. And, and, and again, you know, I know speeding gets picked on quite a bit here because... Uh, if you're like me, we all do it. And if you're not like me, then it's just me who does it. Okay. But there's a... I had a friend who was a uh, highway patrolman. Um, he pulled somebody over who was uh, going over like like, six, like say 68 and a 65. And the guy said, well, isn't there, isn't there a little gray area in this? And then the response was, well, sir, our signs are in black and white. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I still, I still get a kick out of this. Laura, well, Laura and I were driving around. I think we're going up to a funeral somewhere, and she says, "Larry, do you know what the difference between a what was it stopping and hesitating, stopping and hesitating is?" And I said, "No." She said, "Sixty dollars." <laughs> I was like, "Okay, Laura." Uh, <laughs> okay so I'm a pretty terrible driver but I met somebody this week at camp who's worse than me <laughs> we haven't had a speeding ticket for a very long time like I don't think the whole time we've lived in Oklahoma this is so great <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to just tell the story just because it's funny this has absolutely nothing to do with Sunday school it's just funny we're, we're coming back from day camp couple weeks ago and I have um, charisma and um, her cousin angel and uh, Dante. Dante during the on this particular day we're coming on this Friday we're coming back from camp they're moving all the windmill equipment over to Brian's corner before they start going their different ways <coughs> and so I'm passing this rather large piece of equipment and charisma says Oh, I hope they don't take Larry away for speeding. <laughs> to which Dante said, Oh, he's going so fast they won't even catch him. <laughs> <laughs> and she's told that story a few times. I was going to say. Yeah, that yeah. yeah. It, we were just. Yeah, Christmas told that part a few times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was just pretty fun. I'm just passing a, just passing a truck. Just passing a truck. Okay. Um, here, here's the next part of verse 16 is because by observing the law no one will be justified it says if, we, if while we seek to be justified in Christ it becomes evident that we are sinners does that mean that Christ promotes sin now his answer is to this question absolutely not and I don't know if you about you, but I've kind of read this a couple times in my life, and it's like, what is going, what is going on? How does, how could it be construed that Christ promotes sin? Why is this question even relevant? Okay. And the reality of it is, it, and I don't, I want to say I have a really good answer for it. I don't have a really good answer for it. I haven't. 
inkling into the answer for it. It's because if the law defines sin, if the law defines sin, and we can't be justified by the law, but we're justified by faith in Jesus Christ, the only way you get to be in Jesus is by having sin in your life. Does that make sense? Because if you don't have sin in your life, then you are justified through the law. Have I lost you? Repeat all that again. I know what I can. <laughs> the only way that we can be justified through Jesus Christ is because we have sin in our life. Okay? Because without sin, we really are justified by the law, but we're not perfect. Did I make is it still clear as mud? Yeah. Yeah. Um. Okay. Um. So when you meet those people that want to be that don't want to have sin in their life because of the law, like I can think of somebody I know. Okay. They they, they have that. What do you call that checklist? Yeah. They have the checklist thing that, that um, and their whole thing is, I want to get it all right so that I don't have any evidence of sin in my life, and they want everybody else around them to be that same way. So are they justified by the law in their mind? Are they just doing away with the blood of Jesus? Am I making any sense? What I'm saying? I think you're making sense. Is that kind of what you're getting at? No. <laughs> no, no, no. I, it, it's, it, I think you're on the other side of this coin. The idea that we want to hide our sins so that we look like we're justified. I don't think they're hiding it. I think they think they don't have any. Because they have the checklist? Because they have the checklist. They do everything the right way, so they can't do everything. In their eyes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nikki understands what I'm saying. He's yeah. looking at me like yeah. she's connected. But well, what's they? If they think they're perfect, wouldn't they be have a sense of pride? Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they have. They, they, don't, don't, they don't see that as pride. Yeah. 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 Ye
you will. I like, man, I, I'm completely stealing this story because it was so good at camp. Uh, our speaker at camp shared this story, so here it is. Um, I, I just bought a house and I went down to the electric company uh, and I was getting ready to fill out all the paperwork and they said, we have a deal for you today. He said, I'm all about deals. He said, we are going to give you free electricity for life. What? So we want to give you free electricity for life just because we like you. Okay. He said, you are such a great guy. You're living in a great neighborhood. Uh, we just want to give you free electricity for life. We only have one request is that you don't abuse it. So, you know, when you leave the house, turn your lights off. You know, when you're going away on vacation, turn your air conditioner off. But other than that, use all you want. Just don't abuse it. And when he's talking about grace, he said, this is how grace and works look like. I feel so bad because I have free electricity and nobody else does. That when you come over, what I've done is I've taken an exercise bike. And I've got this little wheel at the end, you know, that'll light up the light bulb. And I've got everything running off of this light bulb. So if I want to watch TV, I've got to get on the bike and I've got to pedal real hard, you know, where I can get the TV to work. And because I get tired, I just watch bits and pieces of shows, <laughs> you know. And because the electricity isn't quite enough for me to do on this bike, you know, my refrigerator doesn't work all the time. But I work really hard at doing it. He said, the reality of it is you got free electricity. Just don't abuse it. Our works <laughs> never enough to supply everything that we need. And when he like, said that, it's like, oh, dude, I'm so stealing that. <laughs> I'm so stealing that. Um, and, and so this whole this whole thing here uh, is this is this idea about legalism. Um, verse 18 says, "If I revealed what I destroyed, I prove that I'm a lawbreaker." If sin destroys your life and you're trying to rebuild it through the sin, you've nothing but done more, anything more than just proving that, yep, you're a sinner and you're a lawbreaker. Uh, now, here's these last couple verses here, and then we're going to move on because we've got a couple minutes left. Um, uh, it says, For through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. Uh, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body... I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Now, to take Renee's example, now that we're here, the people who want to live by the law or live by their own works, what they do, what sometimes we do in this is that we will say Grace thank you for being here but I'm going to put you over here and let's see what I can do which leaves us where trying to rebuild what it was that we destroyed Is it following the laws just to, trying to follow the laws as a form of showing appreciation for the grace of God? And why did you give us the laws think if I, they weren't to be followed? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think I understand what you're asking. Well it all has to do with the heart though. Because Okay, like let's just say where you talking about speeding. You know, we may go five over. Why, why don't we go twenty-five over? Twenty-five over over might cause us to wreck and kill someone, hurt ourselves. Five over, it's probably not going to. I've done one hundred and seventy in a car. Not on the road. I'm like on a racetrack. That's different. <laughs> but I've done it <laughs> in an environment that it was designed to do. Yeah. But yeah. But I think our heart. I mean. I don't obey the laws. Let's just say, talking about scripture, I don't obey them or do 
X, Y, and Z because of the checklist. I do it because of the relationship that I have with Christ and because of where my heart is. Was there a time when it was about a checklist? Probably when you're younger, or for me when I was younger and learning. I didn't understand why I just think this is what you're supposed to do. Does that make sense? But I think the heart, I mean, I, yeah, I think our, our heart yeah, should drive this. It's not that you're doing it for reward no. or for uh, for being punished. Right. But just because showing appreciation for God's grace. But I do know people, and you may too, but Larry and I have really encountered it previously, where it's all about the law, and they do it just because. They don't have any relationship. They do it because it's going to make them look good, or it's going to give them a better standing in heaven. They're going to get there before me. I'm not sure what their whole motive is. But it is all about the law, and they don't want anything to do with grace at all. And their argument to me, especially with several individuals, well, that makes it too easy. Grace makes it too easy. Okay. I don't know I understand that. Say that again. Their argument to me was when they didn't want anything to do with grace. Is grace, grace makes it too easy. Yes. And that's that's not that's not how it's supposed to be, Renee. It's supposed to be hard. What, tell me where that's at in here. Yeah, because Jesus didn't say my yoke is easy and my burden is light for nothing. <laughs> so, you think, what in the world did just Larry just draw up here? Um, have you seen the advertisements on TV with the progressive insurance company that you can plug this thing into your car and it measures how good you drive? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I assume you have one. I did have you one, did have just, one, just to lower my rate. Okay, did it, did it do it? Did no, it work? because I could not, it wouldn't work. Every time I'd slow down and be, I'd go, it would, I, you could not make the thing work. Okay, and I'm not a bad driver. And I <laughs> called them, I said, I finally had to send it back. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I, it no. is. They could tell me just what I've been liberal and everything when I called them. Does that make your point very clear? I, I never knew anybody who had done that, but I'm probably going to steal your story at okay. some point in time. <laughs> because what, what happens is that in the context of church, we want to become this little beepo meter, okay? <laughs> you know, I, well, whatever you want to call it, okay? Or a data collector, like, you know, there, there's a point, oh, well, I can do da 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 and, you know, now you can see which side of, you know, are you under grace or under, are you under law? And it's like, man, I didn't realize it was that stinky. I was just thinking, just plug it in. It wouldn't do anything other than just say, oh, hey, you're, you're not getting a discount. That's yeah. what I thought, too. Yeah. Uh, you know, so. It beats every stop. In the world of data collection, everything matters. Everything matters, yeah. Yeah, so... Here's, here's the best, I don't know if it's, it's the best one that I can find. It may not be the best, okay? We're going to hop over to Deuteronomy, cha Deuteronomy chapter 9. Uh, Deuteron I know that most of you stayed awake last night hoping that, wow, I really can't wait till Larry gets to Deuteronomy chapter 9. <laughs> <laughs> Eloise was like really worried about it about 2 o'clock in the morning, weren't you? And she's just going on. We're all good. <laughs> in, in the book of Deuteronomy, they're getting ready to go across the river into the promised land. Uh, God gives them some things here through Moses. He says, Hero Israel, you're now about to cross the Jordan and to go in and dispossess nations greater and stronger than you with large cities that have walls up to the sky. The people are strong and tall. Anakites. Uh, you know about them and you've heard it said who can stand up against the Anakites. I mean, these guys were the bad dudes, okay? Uh, they, they are the champions of the world here and nobody's going to beat them. He says, but be assured today that the Lord your God is the one who goes across ahead of you like what? Okay.
What are they crossing? Before we get to the fire part, the Jordan. What's in the Jordan? Does anybody know? Water. Water. Okay. This is crazy Larry talking, okay? I can be completely wrong. <laughs> I can be completely wrong. We have a flood. We are told in the book of Revelation that the world will be consumed by fire. We have, in our Christian experience, we have baptism, water, and then we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which made itself in tongues of fire, okay? Beyond just this little story is some symbols and some patterns uh, that just kind of pick up on, okay? Because here's how I'm going to lay this out. When you see water, think of baptism. When you see fire, think of sanctification, okay? In this story, uh, water gets rid of the law. Sanctification changes us from the inside out, okay? Just kind of watch this here. Uh, God's going ahead uh, like a devouring fire. He will destroy them and subdue them before you. Now, in this statement, who's doing the work? Completely, right? This is God's work. Men are going to cross the water. But God is going to be the one who's doing the work. Um, and you will drive them out and annihilate them quickly as the Lord has what? Promised. Uh, after the Lord has driven them out, do not say to yourself, the Lord has brought me here to take possession of this land because of my righteousness. Okay? So we have these people. this is water the reason we get into the promised land God's being very plain here it's not because of our righteousness he explains why. Watch this. This is incredible. When I came up, when I started reading this, uh, he said, "It's not because of your righteousness or integrity that you're going in to take possession of their land, but on account of the wickedness of these nations." Uh, but the Lord your God will drive them out before you and accomplish what he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand then, it's not because of your righteousness that the Lord your God is giving you this good land to possess. For you, a, for you are a stiff-necked people. <laughs> now. I can be completely wrong in what I'm about ready to say. I don't think I am, but I can be. Because I'm going to start taking this as an example of what's going on. In this understanding between grace and the law, in our trying to understand how it is that God is doing these things, God gave them the command to cross the Jordan. You're going to do it do it. <laughs> okay? It's going to be a fight. These guys are big. These guys are nasty. And they're at the top of the list. I mean, they are the champions of the world. You're not going to beat them. Everybody in the world knows how bad the Anakites are. You're just not going to do it on your own. He says cross. He says, he says about himself that God is a devouring fire. That he's going to do the work and that it is promised that this work is going to be done. 
Now, in this example, in the Anakites, I see some spiritual things in life that are happening. Because what happens is, is we want to have this you know, list, okay? And there are things that we wrestle with, and there are things that we struggle with, and there are things that we fight in this process of sanctification. That is how God cleans us up. A number of years ago, in a church that I was at, we were redoing our church library. I really wrestled with it. I didn't fight it because I knew better. But they had designed a section of the library that was called self-help. <laughs> okay? And self-help is you read a book about this and you get better. <laughs> you know? Oh, how many of you have ever read a book <laughs> that just completely got rid of an issue in your life? Or did it just kind of magnify it and just kind of bring your attention to it? It's like, oh, maybe I ought to work on that. But you never get it perfected. <laughs> That's usually where I am, okay? It's like, oh, yeah. You know, how do I do this? It's like, oh, oh, oh I'm really bad. Okay, I'm really bad. And here's 17 ways that I get over not being bad, but I can't do 16 or 16 and a half of them, right? Um I'm thinking, why did you even write this book? You already got it figured out because I don't have it figured out. <laughs> so you can kind of throw it off to the side. Well, here's the thing. When, when I came across this passage in, in comparison to what it is we're taking a look at here in Galatians, I saw at least a lot of myself in it. And if I see myself in it, that means probably I'm in good company because we're all kind of the choir the same. Here's the interesting thing. God says, I'm a stubborn, stiff-necked person. And what we have a tendency of doing, even in how Renee described her example of a, couple, uh, a couple minutes ago, is that we go through the Christian experience and we say, look how good I am. <laughs> okay? And the reality of it is, is that God said, you're not get, you don't get there because you're good. <laughs> You see, you're not there because of your righteousness, which means, on the contrary, that we're already unrighteous, right? So God's, how God sees you and me and everybody else around us is that we are stubborn, we are stiff-necked, and we are unrighteous. I don't know that I like God seeing me that way, but that's probably in all reality who we are. There's a command, cross the water and let the fire do the rest. Um, the thing is, when we get into this promised land, okay, he said there is a fight involved with it. There is a fight involved with it. The amazing thing is, is that it's not our fight to win. We just have to show up. I don't know how that works. I'll be honest with you. I don't know how that works. But in clearing out the wickedness that's inherent in the land, in our promised land, we go across the water and then we do this. Now, again, I can be completely wrong. But I think that this little story about the Anakites about God's promises to the Israelites in that example also give us a pretty good indication of what our responsibility in this is. We just follow. We just follow. There are going to be times in our Christian experience that we have something to fight. I wish it was easy, man. But it isn't. We can't sanctify ourselves. It's the Holy Spirit that sanctifies us. It's the Holy Spirit that changes us. So getting back to your question that I didn't answer earlier. Do we follow the law because of our appreciation of God's grace? I loved how you worded that question. We follow the law because God completely changed our hearts. And it's no longer a law. It's a just a good place to be. Does that make sense? Just a way of life. Just a way of life, yeah. Yeah, I like that. 
Um, and that takes some time for us to get there. Uh, so if you ever struggle with stuff, you're in good company, okay? You're in good company. The amazing thing is that God's work and God's grace is present throughout all of this. Let me pray we're going to be done. Father God, I thank you so much for your love. I thank you so much for this grace. Father, you are the, you are the promise. Uh, it's your work to do in our life. Help us to build a relationship with you such that, that we're responsive to let you work, to let you be that devouring fire, to let your Holy Spirit sanctify us, to change our hearts, to change our, our lives, and to just bring us into that promised land. Father, we're already in it. Uh, we just got a lot of work to do here. Uh, but it's not work that saves us. It's just the very simple thing of you're doing your promises in our life. Help us, Father, to be submissive, help us to see each other as we're all works in progress. And just let us give a lot of grace to each other. These things we pray in Jesus' name.